they also I got to do like the coolest thing that I've ever done in beer at Oscar Blues. We'll talk about it on the show, but it's fucking awesome. Awesome, man. Yeah. And with that said, this is a very historic episode twenty five of that quarter podcast. century. Woo-hoo. Quarter century. Yeah. Q five. We've made it. As usual, I am one of your hosts, Mike, and joining me are the usual suspects. We have Hollywood himself, Jeff. That's me. And then <laughs> he hasn't quit yet, Jeff. <laughs> <He's still laughs> yet. For a second episode, he's still here. <laughs> <laughs> That's me. Completing the hosting trifecta, we have Chris. How's it going, everyone? So, a long overdue. I know we missed last week because uh, Jeff was in a uh, Asheville, which we'll get to later. But right now, we have some some breaking news, kind of, sort of, with uh, some layoffs. So we're going to go to our beer news guy, unofficially, just for this episode for now. <laughs> <laughs> I just got a promotion. Awesome. <laughs> He's got a promotion, yeah. Dude, Chris uh, has been here one week. He gets a promotion. I've been here for all 25 episodes, and I've gotten nothing. I'm also gonna need a music bed for this whole breaking news thing. Oh, all yeah, I got well, was, I'll find you one. <laughs> all I got was a moniker of Hollywood, and that's it. Jeff, when I, you get when you're at the top, you can't you don't get promoted, dog. Yeah, man. Plus, that's street cred. <laughs> yeah, street cred. <laughs> so, Chris, I think we should Mike, promote both of us over Mike. Oh. <laughs> so this is mutiny. We all know this like shows me, Jeff. We all know this shows me. <laughs> yeah, but I'm, at least at least us two are drinking. That's true. That's true. You got me on that one. So, (laughs) the longest news intro ever. (laughs) I'd watch more news if they all went. Right, it's like Fox News. This is why people watch us. what's, What's going on, Mr. Chris? So if, uh, if people haven't seen over the Facebooks and the Instagrams, um, apparently Stone did a recent layoff. And, and I guess the, it, it became a big story. I'm not entirely sure why outside of a few things, but um, they reportedly laid off about 75 people um, just kind of that day. They got 60 weeks or 60 days severance and some job transitional stuff. So, I mean, it, they're not just SOL. Right. But, I mean, this is a company that, you know, is, na- is nationwide, international, actually, at this point. They just opened uh, um, multi-million dollar facilities in Richmond and in Berlin, as well as opening, like, two more, either a hotel and a, and a pilot tasting room as well. So, you know, with those kind of numbers, as far as what they're investing in, it would, it would seem weird that they, they laid everyone off for the reason that they gave, which is um, not being able to really afford them anymore. So... Yeah, if you're expanding, you would think at the minimum you'd be able to transfer them into a different role. You know, if you're opening a new tap room, maybe you take them and put them in the new tap. You know, like, it's weird to lay people off as you expand. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yes, it's very suspicious, too. Yeah, it was just a random thing. And, and it's, you know, I think a lot of people were, were really perpetuating the story because they were wondering, you know, is this the point where the bubble, as people kind of often often explain, is that you know, the first sign of it, but you know, it's, there's a lot of variables to it. Um, it'll be interesting to kind of see how it plays out. Um, at, at the end of the day, business is business, but it's just, uh, it's interesting to see one of the forefathers of, of the craft movement nationwide, at least kind of going this route. So it, I know, I, I don't know when we talked about maybe last episode of the episode before we talked about the whole, and my, actually it was on, uh, Preston's beer chaser show. We talked about kind of the, the value and the impact of, of, of stone opening that hotel, and I really was against it saying, you know, why, why even open something like that when most people get hotels just for a place to crash and they'll go out and gallivant and, and explore the town to where them investing that much money into a hotel, I think is pointless when they should invest that money towards being in existing hotels and not necessarily building their own. And that we kind of talk about like, is the market not only ready for that, but is there a market even for that? A brewery like Stone, like Dolph Shed, having their own hotel or motel, you know, whatever that people can go and stay in and, and have different, you know, deals on their own brand. No, I think there's definitely a, a market for it for sure. I, I just, I mean, it's funny that you mentioned that, that aspect of it as well, because one of the new things that they still haven't pulled off, but uh, they recently agreed to license the, their, their name or their brand um, to another hotel concept for $26 million, 
So, I mean, they're, they're still in the plans to do things like that. And I think that there is a market for it for sure. But, you know, this is one company in changing times. Um, is it reflective of them or is it reflective of the industry? It's just kind of, it's interesting to kind of see both sides of that, you know? Dude, I mean, the thing is like the industry, it, I don't, I don't question if there's a market for anything in craft beer, like anymore. I just kind of think like everything is on the table Anything mm -hmm. that's cool and different and like, dude, people fucking a brewery opens up a hotel. If they do it right, that's cool as shit. If they do it wrong, then it's probably not going to work out just like any other business. But like craft beer hasn't found its true identity yet. In my opinion, it's still just, it's like cool. Like that's its identity is it's cool. It's people, you know, appreciating quality over quantity. It's people appreciating, you know, the, the craft beer culture of, of, you know, being friendly, being outgoing, everybody seems willing to, you know, teach and learn and talk and, and communicate with one another. But as far as a, a market goes, I don't think we've scratched the surface of what craft beer can or wants to be. Absolutely. And we don't, and we don't, even know, what, that, we don't yeah. even know what it can be. So, you know, I, as far as, is there a market for that kind of stuff? I think there's a market for anything in craft beer right now until we figure out whatever that limitation is. And once we hit that bubble, then we'll know. Okay, this is what craft beer is. Yeah, and I, sure. I don't really want to want, want to like make the the way I, I talked about the story sound like I'm I'm trying to like perpetuate the idea of this bubble and this or whatever. But we, you and I can can agree. Yeah. Like everyone has, has mentioned that in some sort of beer conversation. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, dude, yeah. That's every episode. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and, it, and everyone and their mom has a different idea as far as you know whether it's coming or it's gone or this that or whatever. It's just it's interesting to see a company like this who's who's prided themselves on on growing and being the, the anti big beer and, and really um, shaping a lot of what people drink out there in the nation these days kind of take this much more business like approach and, and especially with, with what they've already got invested in other things. So, right. I mean, in the, in the grand scheme of things, I mean, 75 people isn't a drastic number, but that's 75 people's lives that you've affected. So, I mean, you know, for being anti big business, they're sure being big business. Well, what's interesting and, about that? Oh, sorry, I thought you. Were no, no, go ahead. No, go, no, go ahead. I was saying. Well, I, I was just doing, um, you know, the little bit of research that we do on the show, uh, if any. But I was looking, <laughs> I was looking it up, and so Stone at the moment is the ninth biggest, um, ninth ninth largest craft brewer in the country. But there's this quote that keeps appearing on everything that says that. It is one of the largest, if not the largest, employer in craft beer. So maybe it's not that they're expanding or not expanding. It's maybe they were overstaffed to begin with. They were employing too many people for their size. Because if you're the ninth biggest, why are you employing more than the eighth, seventh, sixth, fifth, whatever? Sure. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. And that's that's the thing, though, too, with a lot of these these breweries. I mean, no matter how long they've been around – 20, 30 years, I mean, this is still a very fluid time. Things are changing a lot. Um, there is no formula for it. So just because you've been established that long doesn't mean that you know how to handle, you know, declines in national brand growth or, you know, what may be happening to your investments versus what you already have on the table. You know what I mean? Right. Exactly. I mean, I just think it's, I just think it's, it's incredibly interesting that they, instead of letting them go, they could have repositioned them into the hotel team or, or, some other department that's that's like to to fire them or to let them go it's you know you, they couldn't find another purpose for them it sounds like an overcorrect to me it sounds like uh they realized that one of their biggest expenses first their it's first their salaries. income income is their salaries their payroll yeah. is too high and as a percentage of business they wanted to bring that percentage down and it, it to me it sounds like despite doing incredible business they were overstaffed they had too mm -hmm. many people and they just needed an overcorrect in the other direction. And then I guarantee within a year or two, they're going to be hiring all 75 positions back. Maybe not the same people, but I think all those positions will come back as they expand, but they're going to work in that, that payroll percentage to the proper amount of whatever their business is. Sure. I mean, that's the only thing that to me that would make sense is the fact that they were like, you know what? We're overstaffed. Like we don't necessarily need to have these people. So they probably just let him go, but we'll never really get a full answer. Yeah, it's all speculation anyway, you know, until you actually talk right. to Stone, you know? 
Yeah, I'm I act like I know what I'm talking about, but I don't know anything. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's it's interesting too because I mean, like you look at the fact that they got a new CEO uh, in early September. Um, so as I'm not sure what your guys' background with professionally is, but I don't know about you guys, but new new head of the company, changes are going to be made. It is what it is. Oh, oh yeah. So I mean, there's no point in having a new head otherwise. Mm-hmm. Right. And that's probably just part of him, him trimming down and changing things is. You know why? Why spend this money on 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 staff when we can save that much money and put it towards something else? I mean, business wise, it makes sense. But in and seeing what they're doing, and then like, all right, so you're expanding, you're you're growing at this at this rate, yet you're still firing people. It kind of, you know, kind of makes you pause and kind of look at it, look at that differently. I think the overcorrect thing was a pretty good analogy on it. So. Yeah, yeah. So, what do you guys think of? Of you know, Jeff kind of touched on. I kind of want to know what you guys think of craft beer kind of having a lack of identity or not having it developed yet in terms of like the stone story. I think it's awesome. I think it's. I think it is. It's infinite what we can do with it. So it's like, and also I also think it's great because I think some of the most imaginative people are working in craft beer the people who think up these insane recipes and these insane ideas off the wall concoctions. I had a freaking beer in Asheville that was a basil mushroom and something else beer, like, like all what? earthy, like soup. Yeah. But, but that guy is in charge of, you know, that guy has just as much pull as anybody else to develop what the culture of his brewery is. So I think it's just cool that we haven't figured it out yet. And whatever it's going to be is going to be bigger or better than whatever we thought it was going to be. Or it might just end up being exactly what it already is. And we're just going to have a bunch of breweries with really cool tap rooms. And, you know, and some of them are good and some of them are bad. But I think there's going to be people who really push the envelope and just completely create this whole new world of, of kind of like a drinking scene where you're going to have hotels and B&Bs and, and arcades and who knows what else, you know, like awesome. Right, like, <laughs> I mean, that's I, th- I think that's the perk. That's like the big draw to craft beers. I don't think they'll it'll ever get an identity. I mean, there'll be standards set, you know, tap rooms, things that tap rooms have that are successful, just like any other business. Things that pan out and things that always will not pan out. But in terms of defining what craft beer is, in terms of a, of an identity, I don't think it'll ever happen. Just because that, that industry is rotating and expanding and. And, and being creatively different so fast that you won't be able to catch up or, you know, this year was New England style IPA. The year before that was session, session IPAs and the year before, and like it changes so quick and, and, and no, you know, it peaks and valleys so much that I think it's going to lack an identity. I think that's what's going to make it so different and unique. Well, and, and I think that could be part of the draw too. And, and I don't think there's a negative to saying that there's a lack of identity. I think it's just this big ambiguous thing which which the cool thing about it being such a big kind of ominous thing is is the fact that you shouldn't be able to pigeonhole it and it's going to be subjective by who you talk to i mean you might talk to a beer trader who's obsessed with getting you know dark lord and and trading a hunapu for it and just doesn't care about what new random beer the the brewery down the road came out with but then you also have people who get really into it because they met um Steve so and so who just happens to brew brown ale they like at a bar they walked into once and then they really started getting into it so but I think I think everyone kind of has you know the similar traits of they, they care about where their stuff's coming from. Um, they're all relatively cool people, and and the, it's a very self perpetuating industry. So those who get into it are all about trying to see others succeed in it. You know what I mean? Yeah, for sure. And it's yeah. all it's it's open. Mm-hmm. It's like all encompassing, and it's like I love the idea that craft beer people aren't like it's open to everybody. Like if you like pilsners or you like light beers, colches and stuff like people are doing that in craft beer. So it's, so while it's like you're saying, it's ambiguous, it's open to anybody too. It's mm-hmm. so approachable as long as you kind of, and nobody's going to be condescending or dickish to you. I guess there are those people we've talked about in the past who have gotten a little pretentious about it, but in the, they're in the vast minority. Mm-hmm. But like, if you wanted to, if you only liked light beers, you could still be a craft beer drinker. Oh, absolutely, man. And there's a, a quite a bit to choose from. Holy cow. Mm-hmm. All you drink is, is lagers or pilsers or whatever. Oh, that's an endless. Those are endless genres right there. Mm-hmm. Everyone's going to have one. But yeah, you guys want to take a break or you want to just go into uh, the next topic? Let's roll, man. I'm ready All to right, roll. Let's rolling. All right, ain't, ain't no breaks this episode. Episode 25. <laughs> so, Jeff, I'm, I'm going to let you take the lead 
into uh, kind of telling us about your trip to Asheville. God, man, weekend. what an awesome trip! It was just you, Dick. Dude, it's I'm so jealous. <laughs> it's one of those like craft beer meccas that like it's so people know it's good and they know it's got a bunch of craft beer, but like you don't appreciate it till you're there and you see it. But dude, it's just so approachable and it's 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 everywhere. It's we we stayed. So Mike, I sent you the picture of it. Uh, we we stayed literally, literally across the street from Wicked Weed Brewery. Like, like I could talk to people on Wicked Weed's patio from my patio of where we That's were awesome. staying. Yeah. So it was right across Biltmore Avenue, which is like one of the main thoroughfares of, of Asheville. And that's where Wicked Weed is, is on kind of the brewery district side of Biltmore on the, on the, not on the government side of, of downtown. Um, and there's just walking distance from there. Uh, I did in one night walking, we did two we did two bars and four breweries walking within three minutes of each other each one and it's just so incredible the beers are insanely good um but i'll start from the beginning we were driving over we uh i was at a wedding in north georgia so that's inconsequential the drive over was kind of where where things started so we're driving over and on our way into Asheville, we went to um oscar blues which is the first place we stopped at, and Good start. They, they they opened at noon. We got there about eleven forty, so we're out at the outside thing, and every, they're like loading trucks and they're getting deliveries and all this stuff. And some guy walks by, and he's like, "Hey, can I, you know, can I help you guys?" And uh, we're like, "Oh yeah, we're just waiting for the tap room to open." He goes, "Oh well, why don't you come in? Um, we're actually testing hops right now, and we've got the staff all together. If you guys want to come in and just test hops with us, it'll give you something to do for the next twenty minutes." That's awesome. So we go in, they've got 15 different kinds of hops on the table. All the employees of, of the Oscar Blues Brewery, there smelling them and everything. So, you know, they kind of teach us how to smell the hops and everything. And we're, we get the score sheets and we're kind of putting our notes down and everything. And we're about halfway through and the guy, uh, I, I ask him, I'm like, so how often do you guys do stuff like this? And he's like, one time a year. He goes, this is the only day that we do this. We're picking hops for one of our one-offs. And I was like, Oh really? That's that's pretty cool. Which one? He goes, Gubna. So <laughs> yeah, man. So me and me up. and Cassie were two. Uh, we were the two people that day. I mean, uh, they have another brewery, obviously in Colorado. So I'm sure they were testing hops there as well. But as far as the North Carolina brewery goes, we were the only two people that did not work at Oscar Blues that got to test hops for this year's Gubna. Yeah, I mean, outside of Oscar Blues paying you to do it, you got a pretty good <laughs> opportunity there, man. Right. It was it was so cool. They were awesome people, and just the fact, like, we're dumbfounded that they asked us to do it. Like, we were so excited, and then they they thanked us and gave us free burgers for helping out. What? And I'm like, this place is so I, cool. No, I call it bullshit. This didn't happen. <laughs> it the story's not true. <laughs> and it sounds and, too great. And giving us free burgers wasn't just, it wasn't like they just like, yeah, go get free burgers. They had like this funny ass like uh, code that you had to say when you went up to the food truck. So we had to walk up and be like, wait a second, these aren't my pants. And then they give you, <laughs> and then they give you a free burger. And I'm like, this is like, they just have so much fun. And it was, it was awesome. But um, the tap room's small. It's upstairs right in the brewery. Uh, it's part of the gift shop as well. So it's kind of really cool little thing up there. We got Flights pretty much everywhere we went, but as far as the beer goes, you know, it's Oscar Blues. It was all the good stuff. They had barrel aged, um, 10 50, they had brandy barrel aged, uh, G Night. How was no. that? Awesome. That was probably the best beer we had. It was, it was unbelievable. G Night is still one of my favorites. So, like, any mm -hmm. sort of treatment on it, I'm, I'd be all over it. Yeah, that was probably the best beer we had. I, I didn't want to go heavy like I did at, at Funky Buddha because I didn't want to ruin That's my day. Whatever. <laughs> I see where I lie in that. Well, I had a lot of driving through the mountains left to do, so. Oh, like I didn't have a lot of driving for a lot of either. Yeah, but yeah, I didn't. Driving have a lot in of the driving. mountains, though, that's terrifying, man. It is terrifying, yeah. <laughs> so uh, then we went to Sierra Nevada, which we only stayed for for literally one flight, and that was kind of it. Sierra Nevada is one of the most beautiful breweries I've ever seen. That facility in North Carolina, it is like. Willy Wonka and the fucking chocolate factory. Like you come up and it is Disneyland for craft beer. 
the parking lot. There's six six parking lots, and they're all, it was every spot was full. No but, shit. But it felt like an amusement park and not like a craft brewery. And I, you know, I wasn't thrilled with their beer selection. I wasn't. I'm not really ever thrilled with Sierra Nevada's beer, but they didn't have any one off stuff. It was all mainstream. Oh. And it was like really, really mainstream. Like the way the brewery was set up, it was a restaurant. It was tourists. It was not craft beer people. So, um, you know, that was that was kind of disappointing. But it was a cool, cool experience. And the place is gorgeous. Um, but yeah, then we went into Asheville. We went to you know a whole bunch of different places. I'm gonna probably say one of them wrong because I don't even I still don't know how to say it. But I believe it's Baharami is a brewery that's down there. We did a tour of the Funkatorium, which is Wicked Weed Souring Facility. Nice. Mm-hmm. Uh, that was fucking awesome. It's uh, the shortest tour you'll ever take. The place is not very big, but they do only Bretomyces there. Um, there, I was telling Mike when he asked me, he's like, it's amazing how they just put out such great sours. And the reason is that they just have very strict and enforced standards and that's literally it. And they just, they do not brew any regular beers on any system that they've ever brewed a sour on. They keep the facilities completely separate. And if you work at the Funkatorium, you're not allowed to go to the main brewery for 24 hours. So there's no chance of cross contamination. And it's like, that's crazy. and they enforce it. And it's just like, it kind of baffled me that they're like, yeah, if you brew here, you do not go to the other brewery. And if you brew at the other brewery, you don't come here. They're completely separate entities. Yeah, man. Bread is a, it's a hell of an organism, man. So that's, it may sound a little overkill, but you better be safe than sorry, you know? The, yeah. The tour guide yeah, said, absolutely. the tour guide said, and if a nuclear Holocaust happened, there'd be two things left on earth, cockroaches and bread. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, and he goes, and then the bread of Mices will eat the cockroaches. <laughs> <laughs> And make it delicious. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it was just it was it was a trip to see how seriously they took their beer. But it's just such an awesome city. We went to this place called Burial Brewing, um, and the whole place had it had like Tom Selleck and sloth murals and pictures all over the place. So like <laughs> sloth from the Goonies and like Tom Selleck hanging out with their arms around each other, and like just all this like weird art with Tom Selleck and sloth in it. And it's just like, it was just their thing. And I'm like, what's the deal with Tom Selleck? And he's like, I don't know what's not the deal with Tom Selleck. He's a good looking man. <laughs> Typical answer. <Yeah. laughs> and I'm like, yeah, I mean, yeah, he's a good looking guy, I guess. But I don't get why you guys have him all over your walls. He's like, why not? And I'm like, that's I mean, his, he does that's have his... one of the greatest mustaches of all time. And I was just like, the way he said it and just how chill they were, I was like, that's a sufficient answer for me. <laughs> yeah. Like, all right i'm in it i'm so like okay <laughs> well it's so, funny too because like it's like rule of three wise i now have to go here because this is the third time i've heard about the tom Selleck tap room in the last three weeks really yeah i'm not even kidding it's it it has a person it has a personality yeah <laughs> it's, this is the third time i heard about the tom Selleck tap room i said what that as fuck? an adult like that's something <laughs> i have to say as an adult it's it is like it's bizarre but it's so cool and it's like it is a really cool tap room and they actually have really great beers at burial as well so it wasn't tap legit yeah dude i'm yeah. looking at the the tap room right now it looks awesome it's a really cool tap room and they have all their tap handles are like old rusted like farm equipment so they have like rusted Sounds shovels safe. and yeah, rusty hose and, and hose Who doesn't? <laughs> And that's what their tap handles are. It was just a really cool brewery. Um, and I'm, I'm glad I actually got to talk about them on some kind of platform. If nobody listens, then whatever. So what was the uh, the best beer there? Um, at, at Burial, mm-hmm. they had a – it was called Ammunition, I believe. It was a vanilla, chocolate, something or other stout. I, I mean, at this point, it was the last brewery we went to, so I was feeling a little toasty at this point already. But it was you mean it was a, drunk. Yeah, it was a legitimate. <laughs> no it was a legitimate there. I like it. Like, <laughs> yeah. Comparable, I would say, to a ten fifty or you know, or like I don't, don't want to say a Hunapu because it's not that iconic as far as like the bold flavors. But I would say it's it's comparable to like a ten fifty or uh, a wake and bake. It, it was just a very well executed, 
uh, vanilla imperial stout, and it was cho milk chocolate, vanilla, and something else, and it was just well executed, perfect beer. Like I would give it a four point five easily. Holy shit! Nice, um, man. And it they just and but every beer. The thing about it wasn't like that that beer stood out, which it did, but every beer stood out and it's it was stylistically right and they were all just executed you know well and uh burial was uh, with the exception of the funkatorium um was the best place that we went to including wicked weeds actual tap room like they're there you know wicked weed everybody knows wicked weed i could talk about wicked weed on the show for the remainder of whatever we record tonight but right um you know their their regular beers at their tap room are are better than average but they're not exceptional they're you know what they're known for is is their sours right so the funkatorium beers were amazing every single sour that i had absolutely stellar um but you know their ipa is a good ipa their double ipa is a good double ipa but yeah, it's I, tried their, like, I tried their i tried their per pernicious i believe it's called yeah pernicious um about two months ago and that was it was on point man i mean like they're obviously known for their sours but I, their cores were, were good man yeah you guys have uh you guys have a couple bottles of pernicious you're the gift that keeps nice. on giving i like you yeah, yeah you got a couple of those coming your way um and then the the one i was talking about earlier the uh the old-fashioned it's a sour i'm pumped i am fucking pumped for that it's a sour with cherry and orange and uh they made it a some kind of a bitter can i i've heard nothing but good things and then their uh imperial pumpkin barrel aged imperial pumpkin beer you guys also have that is from cool. the funkatorium as well so it was made with bread and ice so i'm assuming it's a sour pumpkin which maybe would be a cool take on it i don't really know i'm not crazy about pumpkins but we're gonna have to do them at one of these episodes soon anyway so I'd yeah. hate to be like stereotypical beer nerd, but Brett not always translating into sour. Could just it's it's one of those like little stuff right. for me. I'm sorry. It's yeah. <laughs> I sound like a D bag, like a grammar Jeff, Nazi. Like, Jeff, you're wrong. <laughs> no, not even that. It can be. Yeah. It 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 always has that funk. Oh, it's got the funk. Go get that yeah. funk. It's gotta and have the, the funk. And the funk can be sour. Give me the funk. But it'll always be the funk. That's that's my pickup line to women. Yeah, yeah. You're gonna give him the funk. You want you want that funk? The funk can be sour. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So, Does so, that work? Uh, well, I locked one down, so I guess it worked oh! once. <laughs> All right, that worked then. I'm not. I can't use that. <laughs> not I, with that attitude. I laugh too much. <laughs> <laughs> I do have to say real quick that the the burial beer company, and I mean this in no no like derogatory sense at all but all of their names of their beers and I'm a, I'm a stickler for names of beers it reads like a metal album it's amazing oh okay. yeah, yeah. No, it is it's like real hardcore yeah like the adoration of the mystic lamb the ocean swallows the sun i'm a fan yeah no their beers were awesome and they're so, yeah they have a defined persona of what they are and a direction they wanted to go and they they ex executed extremely well that's cool, man. I'm a sucker for right. branding. So I love when I see that. Two, I got two questions that are going to lead to a lot bigger things. Jeff, what other breweries you go to, and what were some of the, your highlights in terms of the beer that you drank that you can remember? And then two, is Asheville underrated in terms of a beer town? Uh, for, that, that could be for the group. Yeah, definitely. But not just a beer town. It's um, for for a fun town, like for like a, a young person – I don't want to call it hipster, but you know what I mean. When I say hipster, right. I mean, you know, young professionals, millennial or whatever you want to call it. Right, right. It, it's, it is just a really cool, uh, uh, forward thinking, um, open kind of town. And, and there's just a lot of really cool, interesting places to go. And they kind of, they're not, they break the mold. They don't do anything stereotypical and, and simple. It's all different and it's all interesting. Um, like we went to a place that uh, it was a sake bar, uh, and I had this place actually stood out more to me than a lot of the breweries did. But they made their own sake. That's and cool. It's called yeah. um, oh, it's called sake bar, something pit stop I think or, but it's it was like a sake bar with uh, just all kinds of different cool foods, and I had an unfiltered sake. We had a jalapeno. 
um, pineapple sake. We had uh, a oh, fuck a ginger lemon sake. But they make them all there, and they were all fucking delicious. And is it a uh, is it Ben's Tune Up? Ben's Tune Up, yes. And yeah, that man, place, give him a shout out there. That place is <laughs> awesome. Free plug. <laughs> Free plug. Place is absolutely awesome. They also have a craft brewery attached to the other side of it. Um, and I saw, and I don't know if they did this or not, but if they did, super awesome props for them as well. It's they have a courtyard kind of thing in the middle, and they had a sign, a big chalkboard sign in the courtyard. And it had like couches and all these outdoor furniture and it said accepting refugees for hurricane Matthew. And so I think they allowed people to stay there during the hurricane and like, and and, like protect, you know, either whether it be homeless people or people who couldn't, you know, protect themselves for the hurricane. So I thought that was super cool. That's awesome. Um, We went to high wire brewing uh, which was another really, really awesome brewery that was right next to Tune Up. Um, they had they had some very, uh, I'll call them stylistically inaccurate uh, <laughs> saisons and gozas, but despite being inaccurate, they were really tasty beers. So I'll give them a real, I'll give them, a, I'll give them a thumbs up and thumbs down at the same time. But right. uh, they had one called like Pink Drink. And it was supposed to be like a, a raspberry saison of some kind or something like that. And I'm probably getting this wrong, but it was uh, either way. It wasn't stylistically accurate, but it was a, a fantastic beer. So I, <laughs> I did enjoy that. Um, they also had, and I want to look it up really quick. So actually, I'll circle back to this one because I don't want to get this beer wrong because they're Scout, I want to say, or Imperial Porter was really, really, really good. Um, Mm -hmm. and I want to actually give them props for what it is and say it correctly. Um, other than that, it was all, uh, it was all a lot of, you know, high quality, stylistically accurate, uh, fun, cool breweries, interesting concepts, but the beer was better than average, but not exceptional for the most part, you know, at at high wire or in general, in general, as far as Ashley goes. Okay. But, all right. All right. But you know, but they have the standouts. Like they have burial. Sure. They have burial. They have wicked weed. They obviously have Oscar Blues in Sierra Nevada, right outside the city. Um, they have uh, what's it called? Asheville Brewing Co. Asheville. Yeah, yeah. And then there's mm-hmm. like a Pizza Port or whatever the fuck. Uh huh. They have New Belgium is in the city now, I believe. Yeah, they're around there. Yeah. Um. So they have. I mean, their beer scene's incredible, and it's all walking distance from each other, but. The coolest part about it is if you're, you know, I love craft beer. Obviously, we said this show is centric around craft beer. However, in honor of our 25th episode, I'm drinking a 15-year scotch tonight. Class things up a bit. I can't talk. But if you don't only want to do beer, you can go to breweries. You can go to, you know, where whatever you want to do. But sake in bars. Between, it's sake bars. But in between the breweries, there's sake bars. And then there's uh, rum bars. And there was this rum bar that does like educational tour through the history of rum and and what rum with r-h-u-m versus rum is and then they you know they give you rum flights and you can do sake flights at the sake Ooh. bar and that's really cool man yeah. it's just like everything we did was really awesome they had a bunch of craft cocktail bars it has it's just every single place you go has its own personality and um i would highly 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 recommend going to Asheville. it's one of those few towns outside of florida that I left and I was like, I could live there. Like that's a town I could live in. Sure. I'm sure all of us <laughs> could live in Asheville. Yeah, and the, that's yeah. every, every single time I've ever seen somebody come back from Asheville, they see the exact same thing. Yeah. <clears throat> so, uh, what were some of the, the, the beers, Jeff, that kind of stuck out to you? Um, I have to remember them by name. No, you just, you know, what, uh, brewery and, and style. I had a, uh, well, I had a flight at every brewery I went to, and I went to seven breweries in one night. So I, I will be honest with you, I don't remember names of most of the beers. <laughs> so, but High Wire, uh, fantastic Imperial Stout, um, good sours, good. I wouldn't say good sours, good uh, light and sour styles like saisons and and sure. uh, 
Berliner Weisses. Actually, had a couple good Berliner Weisses at High. Where did you go? I'll give you that. So, um, I'm still proud. <laughs> so there, I'm tearing uh, up a little bit. Ma- yeah. Maharami had really interesting styles, none of which are actual styles, um, but they were cool because they pushed the envelope and just made what I would call specialty ales for a lot of their beers, and they were just really, really cool. Um, and I-, I don't know how to describe them, but their beers were just interesting and different. We had a uh, sour imperial stout there. That was really good. Um, we also had, I mean, most of the stuff in Asheville was actually sour, to be honest with you. A lot of the beers were sours there, but sure. Um, but we had a sour imperial stout there, and we had, what was their really good one? It was a Goza, I believe, but it was a really, I mean, just super cool Goza. That different, different ingredients you wouldn't expect in it. Um, I, I can't remember the name of the one brewery that I went to next to Buxton Hall. It's connected to Buxton Hall. So pretty much every place you went to, they, they had pretty solid sours or sour-like oh, yeah. sour beers. Oh, definitely. The beers that really stood out to me, though, um, were at the Funkatorium. A lot of them were um, just uh, incredible. Uh, one of my favorite beers now of all time in my top five is uh, Silencio by Wicked Weed. Um, Did you bring any back? I, I brought a bottle back for myself. Oh, man. Unfortunately, I couldn't bring you guys back one because they, they didn't bottle it in the Funkatorium, and we couldn't think we could get it. So we you know we bought a bunch of the other stuff. And, sure. um, and then when we went to Baharami, they had two bottles of it. So despite um, not being able to get it at Wicked Weed, we still were able to get two bottles, but that's all they had. So Cassie got one, and I got one. Okay. Uh, but let's see what else we got over here. The obviously the old fashioned one is going to be really cool. Um, Palm Roselle, that was a good one. Barrel aged American sour fermented with pomegranate and hibiscus. Pretty much anything I bought, I really liked. Oh, okay, good. Mont- Montmoretto is a really, really cool sour. Supposed to taste like an amaretto sour. Um, so it's made with, let me look this up to make sure, barrel-aged American sour fermented with cherries and almonds. And it's mm-hmm. like it's like a lot of almond and a little bit of cherry, and it just fucking, it, it's killer. It's like an awesome sour. It's I'm like, digging almonds right now in beers. It's really dude, it's, it. I mean, it's wicked weed, obviously. Whatever the, you know, whatever sours they're putting out are going to be good. So, um, But I picked up a few bombers of their stuff, and it's all affordable. It was like really cheap. Bombers at Wicked Weaver were fifteen bucks. That's um, not bad, man. That's you know, cheap. Some and that was for their sours. When we went to, when we went to the actual brewery, um, I bought a four pack of, of uh, the Pernicious. It was like eight bucks, and I bought a handful of uh, of their regular beers that were like five six bucks a piece for bottle for sixteen ounce bottles, and then the bombers were like ten bucks. I spent. Ninety-one dollars, and I walked out with a case of beer. That's insane, dude. I yeah. love buying from breweries because the stuff is just so much cheaper than a store you and fresher. And fresher, yeah. Oh, oh, oh man. So I mean, so it's kind of going the topic. I kind of want to know Chris's opinion now that Jeff's talked a lot. I'm tired of hearing his voice. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm actually not. I got a question for him, real quick. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Go for it. So, so. You know, being down here in, in Florida, we don't really have too many locations that, that have so many breweries within close proximity of each other. Mm-hmm. And and I think you can kind of appreciate this from being in the industry on, on the side of, you know, running bars and restaurants and right. things like that. Is it, do, do you see them like kind of competing for the same clientele being so close together or are they all kind of getting their piece of the pie? Um, to be honest with you, I see it as uh, as like a community-based everybody shares the same clientele. Mm -hmm. Um, There is obviously an air of like, of uh, competition, but at the same time, I actually think they all feed off each other. So um, that's cool. That's what I was hoping to hear. I deal. So I, where, where my restaurant that I'm working at now is, is in a a small downtown. uh, And it's like a two road walking distance everywhere, kind of a downtown strip in Stewart Mm -hmm. and Black Marlin. And there's yeah, Black Marlin down in Stewart. Come on. Come on. Um, but there's 
two or three restaurants that are similar concepts to ours like as far as clientele would go the same clientele we share them and when they're busy we're busy and when we're busy they're busy but if they're dead we're dead gotcha. so mm. while we can while we compete with each other for business obviously most people go to one for dinner one for dessert and drinks one for happy hour and they end up at all three every night and that's how i feel like Asheville is like we were not the only people actually we ran into the same people the same faces at a lot of the breweries we went to that's really um, cool and I think that most people bar hop and skip and get one or two beers at each place and end up going to three or four breweries in a night. And, yeah. and see, I love hearing things like that too, because you hear stories like Asheville having 20 plus within, you know, a specific mile radius. Yeah. You hear things like, you know, San Diego having almost a hundred plus, um, and everyone still kind of benefits with the friendly competition thing, which I'm hoping that one day here in Florida, we can kind of get to the same thing throughout certain little areas. So yeah, it felt like there was a sense of community that they almost help each other. Um, and, and just like, I know I'm not in a brewery scene, I'm in a restaurant scene, but um, when I first started at, at Black Marlin, one of the one of the managers over at one of my, uh, you would call it a competing restaurant, but a neighboring restaurant on our street came in and we were talking. He's like, oh, you're the new GM, that's cool. This, he goes, listen, man, I just want to welcome you to the neighborhood and to the community and you know, if there's anything we can do to help you out, let us know. If you ever need help, come right down the street. We're there. So that's cool. even though it's a competing restaurant, like they're there to help you. We're there to help them. They come over after work and drink at my bar. We go and eat dinner over at their bar all the time. So like, it's just, it's that community feel is, is Good, man. really cool. And I, I think that breweries even have it more than restaurants do, you know? Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, they both rely on each other to bring in business, but yeah, is there a competition? Sure. I mean, you know, a lot of people go to one brewery, get a flight, go to another brewery, get a flight, and but you know, I would assume they want them to stay there longer, get more beer, more money they mm -hmm. make. Right. But we kind of, you know, we kind of have something like that, in, uh, Chris, in Sanford, that we have, uh, <laughs> we have Wops Hops uh, that's open, we have Sanford Brewing that's open, and we got. Uh, I saw they recently opened, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. A soft opening. Then we have a broken compass that is going to be open. But we, we then also have the best, one of the best craft bar, craft beer bars in such a Florida cellar city. I love that place. Doesn't brew beer, but they have enough there to, you know, be categorized in, in, in the pot there. So, well, know, they're we also expanding a, too. They I are believe, expanding. Right? Whiskey bar. Yeah. yeah. Or liquor bar, I'm sorry. But I mean, we kind of mm -hmm. have like that, that in, uh, in Sanford in terms of, of, different breweries and walking distance now are they on the same yeah. level as Asheville? absolutely not and, and i'll take full credit for saying that yeah absolutely man i'll take full credit for saying that but um i mean it, it has its own thing of you know you go to sanford go to willetree get some great german food and just walk around and bar hop and brewery hop and you know that's we have something kind of like that San sanford's actually a really cool and a different kind of downtown scene i used to love going to sanford and going over to like wolfies on the water and then go into <laughs> and then go into a, uh, what's it Little called fish huge pond what's yeah, the man. trading co um <laughs> what's trading co um god oh, west end oh, west end, west yeah. end, dude. Yeah, west dude. end the college fucking... bar of sanford <laughs> and then and then like you said celery city celery dude oh dude, yeah dude, it's, it's just there's yeah. too many to name what about the wet spot you guys ever go there no crunchiest mm -hmm. biker bar ever Sanford, it's awesome. <laughs> I can't believe I haven't been there with my lifestyle that aligns with that. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> but what do you guys think of of Asheville being, you know, uh, you know, all the beer towns or beer cities in the country? Where do you guys think Asheville lands? Is it overrated? Is it underrated? Is it just like the fact we're in the southeast that we know about more than people who live in, I don't know, Maryland or, or Colorado or stuff like that? So before you get the real answer from somebody who was recently there, <laughs> I'll just I'll comment as somebody who who hasn't been, um, <laughs> but has heard a lot of secondhand accounts and things like that. I, I just, You've never you been know, to Asheville? I I have been, but long oh, it's been a while. I was twenty one. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I didn't get to partake in the whole beer scene that was going on there, but sure. you, you you hear nothing but positive things about it. Um, you it's obviously made its name as a mecca. Uh, at least in the southeast, if not the east coast region, mm -hmm. um, so they must be doing something right. You know what I mean? I I, I don't think there's there's anything overrated about it. 
Um, the fact that all those breweries can sustain themselves with with the same kind of clientele, they've got to be doing something all right. Um, I mean, like like I said before, I hope that one day that same kind of model translates down, and you could look at that many breweries within a specific area as as a bad thing. But I I think you know with with national brand sales going down. Uh, with people kind of focusing a little bit more on local, I think it's getting a lot more in terms of people want to see where their beer is coming from. People want to see who's making it, want to kind of actually watch a brand grow or a beer grow or brewery grow. Um, so they're going to go check out everything that's around them as well. You know what I mean? So the more that we have in this area or the more that Asheville has in that area to kind of help perpetuate that movement is a good thing. So absolutely. Jeff, you want, you want to go in or you want to take a break? I don't know. You want me to go in or you want to go for uh, I'll go. I'll, I'll give you a little break here. I think in terms of East Coast, I think Asheville is the, the capital for craft beer uh, from Maine all the way down to Florida. From what literal I know in terms of, you know, what's going on up in, in, in New England and in all that area, um, I think Asheville is, is probably one in terms of just everything being so close. Um, I think Miami is, is pretty underrated in terms of – from what I've read, from the the opinions of, of like Miami Lauderdale, like yeah, 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 right, right. So Miami Lauderdale, I think, is incredibly underrated uh, in terms of like the whole East Coast scope of it. I think a lot of people give a lot of attention to uh, the you know the the trilliums, the tree houses, which is they make great beer, but um, I think Miami Fort Lauderdale is underrated. Tampa. I'm on the fence about, um, but I think Asheville is, for the East Coast is 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 is, uh, is, is number one, um, and then West Coast I have to pick San Diego for sure. I will say, even though I've never been there, for for Tampa, um, I, I'd like to give kind of like a little shout out to St. Pete, like Clearwater area. Oh hell yeah, yeah. dude! Because like you can literally walk down the street and you got you know uh, Green Room, a um, couple other ones that are down that way. Green Room in Jacksonville. I'm sorry. Uh, no, Green Bench. I'm sorry. Green Bench. Green, um, yeah. Green you Bench. Also, cycle. Yeah, cycle. You have uh, you have rap brewing, which if you oh, know, rap. Rap. <laughs> you've never been down there, like We're thick big life. Rap. Go down there. Love rap. No. Yeah, you're right. I- I'll give you credit. Yeah, I, but I categorize rap. Tampa with St. Pete and Clearwater. <laughs> Gotcha. Well, well it's weird because they don't. I don't know if you know that. You know, like, I'm that sure bridge. Miami, Fort Lauderdale, the same way. They're like, <laughs> no, we're Boyd Beach. Fuck you. We're not Miami. <laughs> and anyone who's not there be like, nah, you're, you're. Yeah, no, yeah. yeah. <laughs> My, Miami better count Fort Lauderdale in their beer scene when they're talking about it because if they don't count the greater Fort Lauderdale area, they lose Funky Buddha and Ducell. And that might be the two best ones down there. <laughs> and that's probably a whole other argument where Due South is. <laughs> You know where they lie. Are they are they South Florida? Or are they are they just East Coast? I count them as the greater Fort Lauderdale area. I mean, I would too, but we got we're so off controls. topic now. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so as far as is it overrated, underrated, or rated properly? I think that it is underrated, but not in a way that I think is a, a is a bad thing. Um, I'm not saying that they're underrated and people don't rate them properly. I think people rate them where they are right now. But having just come from there, you have no idea the scope of what Asheville breweries are going to hit on the East Coast. Every single one of these breweries that we went to is expanding aggressively, getting into bigger distribution. These beers are going to be found on the East Coast in the next two years all over the place. Burial is out of a tiny tap room. They're expanding to a giant facility. I, I think he said three warehouses. That's that they're insane. Going to be brewing out of uh, it, within the next six months. He said they're going to be expanding down to Georgia, South Carolina, and all of North Carolina with targets on Florida and Alabama in the next two years. And that's burial. Uh, you have, um, you've got Wicked Weed who's already brewing out of two facilities. They're about to expand to four facilities. They're going to keep their original two tap rooms, continue brewing one-offs there, and then they're doing – a second Funkatorium and a second uh, distribution brewery. They're going to be all over the East Coast. Um, I, just the, the span of what they're about to hit out of Asheville in the next two, three years is so huge that that it's it's underrated only because we're not there yet. Right. But we're getting there. And, and their reputation is already so good that it doesn't, you know, it doesn't even scratch the surface of what we are doing on the East coast and what they're going to do in the next two years. So 
I, hey, I think underrated, but in a positive way. I just realized I have a buddy that mules beer for me when he travels for work, and I have a bunch of Asheville beers <laughs> that I'm pulling out right now. <laughs> yeah, didn't you get some Asheville brewing? <laughs> yeah, got a Wombo yeah, White Zombie. It's uh, funny. Uh, <laughs> no, White Zombie is fucking good. I had White is Zombie. It? White Zombie is awesome. <laughs> It's funny. I'm actually. I've I've got for my next beer to be the the Westbrook Key Lime goes, which I had Ooh. a mule bring back for me as well. Yeah, I have a bunch. I have. He brought back. I would have gotten a lot more, but his mom drank half of them. But I got a as they quick, do. Uh, Rocket Girl from Asheville Brewing. I got Bojum Gravefield Graveyard Fields, a blueberry coffee porter. Uh, French Broad from Asheville, Wee Heavy Er. A bunch of different beers. I don't want to go too far into it. A bunch of brown ales. I got a a high wire lager. Yeah. Wire. yeah, nice man. So I didn't get I that got one, those, but but I'm sure it's good because high wire had good beer. Uh, Asheville Ninja Porter. Did you have that, Jeff? Uh, I didn't go to Asheville Brewing. Scrub. I wish. <laughs> so I, it, we're gonna. I think it's a good. I think we're about an hour. And I think it's a good time to wrap up. Um, let us know what you think about Asheville Brewing being a beer city or beer town and, and, and kind of tell Jeff where he missed out on or, or beers that he fucking nailed. Tell, uh, me, and honestly, tell me how much of my trip sucked. <laughs> and, and if you are listening, uh, feel free to comment and, and leave an itinerary for me to follow next time I go up there. So. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. I'll let you know. I'll give you the so, load now. Jeff, any, 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 any closing statements? As we're wrapping um, up here. Yes. So high wire goes is called high wire goes. So that I'm just <laughs> I I'm gonna be I'm gonna be a little off base right now, but I wanted to give them the credit for what they what they actually put out. So um, just give me a second, I'm gonna pull up. I just saw pink drink. It was uh, it was classified as a tart wheat beer. Oh, that's and bullshit. I can't figure out. I can't find the. Is it? Uh, is it the Pulsinella? Mm-mm. No, because it's that's the only like big dark one I've seen on their website right now. I know. I'm looking at their website too. I can't find it. But that wasn't what it was. But anyway, I if just wanted. If you checked to, it on Tap, Jeff, you'd fucking know what you drank. I was not <laughs> in any position to be putting God. anything on on Tap that day. Yeah. I thought you said you were just toasty. I was real toasty. Fun fact for everybody about Jeff. When Jeff drinks, he really understates his drunk level. So when he says, oh, man, yeah, I was just toasty. He was blackout drunk. I was pretty drunk. Just like at I mean, water ale. He's like, no, nah, man, to I'm just toasty. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff doesn't wow. fucking remember Toasty's half of that rejected. episode. <laughs> Lauder ale was maybe the drunkest I've ever been while doing an episode. No, no, False. Lauderdale was the drunkest slash most hungover I was because we were all, I was like hungover by the time we did that episode because I drank I the drunkest episode I ever done was Funky Buddha by far because I I like blacked out before we even started doing that one. <laughs> I'm gonna have to go back and listen to that one again. <laughs> go about halfway through. <laughs> I let me tell I you about this. Started, <laughs> I started at eight percent, and I had four beers before that, and each one increased in ABV. So what did you, what did you guys talk about? We got some friends. I was talking. <laughs> My name's Hollywood. So for drunk, I'm toasty. <laughs> <laughs> Chris, <laughs> Chris, you got any 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 closing uh, comments? <laughs> uh, no, Not man. I, th- I, I think it was a pretty good episode, and and especially after hearing about all these all these different experiences, I'm I'm kind of geeking out. I'm gonna. I'm, Gonna have to plan an Asheville trip coming up soon, man. Yeah, for sure. we get to interview you. <laughs> yeah. yeah, for sure. Got to do it. It's awesome. Sure. Definitely worth the trip. And then you can visit Chris at Winter Windermere's Crappy Festival <laughs> next weekend. <laughs> <laughs> and you. And oh yeah, if you're in, there, yeah, yeah, if you're in the area, we'll, we'll definitely be out that way. Some of us are pouring beer, some of us are drinking it. So, or both. Or both. If you know how to multitask. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and if you're not going there, then come to Stewart and hang out with me at Black Marlin. <laughs> have, a, have a Ballast Point Black Marlin in Black Marlin. Yes. Yeah. And then make yeah. Jeff Port and then so you don't want Black Marlin Seption. Pour it out. 
I don't even know so, yeah. what you said, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so tired. Um, <laughs> but yeah, uh, me and Chris will be at uh, in Windermere's Craft Beer Festival next week. The twenty what what the twenty second? Yeah, twenty second. I think it's from the, four to eight. Yes, yeah, four to eight. It's a Saturday. Right. Um, Check out their website or their, their we'll website be, or their we'll Facebook. Be, They're still selling tickets and stuff. So. Chris will be uh, will be separate but together. Uh, I'll be pouring for Mosquito County. Chris will be pouring for who will be pouring for? Uh, CFHP. CFHP. Mm-hmm. So come on by and visit us. I will be probably in my black at the bar shirt and I have to get Chris one. I so haven't planned what I'm wearing that day yet, but I'll okay. Be, yeah. Well, find us. We'll be there uh, floating around. So if you guys are in the area, come check it out. Tickets are still available. I think they're 40 bucks um, around that. Around there, but it's October 22nd in downtown Windermere. So come on by. But besides that, man, uh, next week, stay tuned. We will be talking about the GB, great uh, GABF uh, ceremony because that was the other week as well. Yeah, they announced the winners over the over the last weekend. Yep. Yep. So that's gonna be next week's episode. We'll go over that and kind of dive down into some of the great news that we got, especially locally with Red Cypress. Yeah. Silver for their yeah, man. I love them over there. Red Not only Red Cypress, but also Coppertail. So. Coppertail, yeah, they, they won too. But that's going to be next week's episode. So, guys, as always, thanks again for listening and kind of watching. If you watch the episodes, they're not very fun, but you have that ability. But until next time, thanks again. See you. Peace. Cheers.